10 years is a long time. It was on November 16th, 2011 when, inspired by some wonderful video game YouTubers, I entered my college's media production classroom and created my first Top 10 Countdown. Hello gamers and otherwise, I am the Green Scorpion and this is my first ever video game countdown. I'm still very proud of what I accomplished back then, but for my next few videos, I want to go back and remake some of my original countdowns, specifically the ones that predate Weapons Month 1, where I started to find my own unique style, partnered up with my best friend Comic Foil, and also bought a thesaurus. Not that the original countdowns were bad or anything, but they were certainly... slipshod and bedraggled. With that said, let's begin with the list that started it all. Hello everyone, the Green Scorpion here, and heroes. A terrifyingly vague topic. Nowadays I tend to use very specific concepts for my videos, the kind where you're surprised I found 10 examples at all. But heroes could go in a lot of different directions, and in the original list, it did. For the remaster, I want to set some solid criteria for being a hero. Our definition of heroic has changed over the course of history. In ancient times, a hero was just someone who did great deeds who slew a hydra or pulled a sword out of a stone. In a modern context, a hero is someone who helps others, who has a positive impact on the world, and who serves as an example of how others should conduct themselves. Not just someone you can depend on, but someone you can aspire to. So to combine these ideas, I'm looking for characters with a strong moral backbone, who will do the right thing even when it's hard for them. I'll also be taking into consideration what they were able to accomplish, but I admire characters for trying more than actually succeeding. Characters who can be courageous in the face of insurmountable odds, who will put the good of others before themselves. They don't have to be perfect, flaws just make the hero more interesting. But I'm not looking for gritty anti-heroes here. These heroes save the world because it's the right thing to do, not for money or revenge and not by sinking to the villain's level. If possible, I'd also like it if they can make the player feel like the hero. This is an interactive medium after all, so it's nice to gain the experience of walking a hero's journey in their shoes. Again, this is the broadest of broad topics, and I'm naturally going to lean towards my own preferences, but I'll do my best to be objective. These aren't my 10 favorite heroes necessarily, but at the end of the day, these rankings are my opinion. My educated opinion, I'd like to think, but still opinion. With that, let's get started. They're gonna be sure, they're gonna be soon, and they're gonna be larger than life. We need the top 10 video game heroes. If moral standing is part of being a hero, where better to start than a literal angel? Pit from Kid Icarus Uprising has quite an extensive resume, considering how few games he had in a 30 year period. He's been protecting the people of this Greek-themed realm for decades, and he's defeated multiple gods of darkness, including Medusa, Hades, and the demon Orcos from the Game Boy games. Pitt does all of this despite two major flaws. He's the smallest of the angels, and he can't fly. Not on his own, anyway. But who doesn't love a good underdog story? Palutena seems to. The Goddess of Light, recognizing Pitt's heart and devotion, not only named him General of Skyworld's army, but also made him her closest friend and confidant. Medusa, on the other hand, underestimates the cheerful cherub in her first invasion and spared him the petrification she gave all of the other centurions, instead leaving Pitt destitute at the bottom of the underworld. So what does Pitt do? He embarks on a perilous and tedious task of climbing up the three worlds, collecting the three sacred treasures, and putting a few dozen arrows into Medusa's giant eye. Not bad for a small boy who doesn't know how to read. I never learned how to read! <laughs> yeah, once Pitt got a speaking role in Kid Icarus Uprising, it quickly became apparent he's not the sharpest bolt in the quiver. He has trouble processing moral dilemmas beyond good versus evil, and he eats ice cream off the floor. More ice cream gives you help! Given his unflappable dedication to Palutena, it would be easy to think that Pitt has no real agency outside of his assigned duty. He's basically a tool. But look a little closer and you'll see examples to the contrary. Pitt wants to help people even when Palutena herself says there's no time. And when Palutena is controlled by the Chaos Kin that turns her evil, Pitt proves that he won't just follow her no matter what. He keeps to his stance on protecting humanity, even when his creator, the embodiment of light, is against him 
and goes the extra mile to return her to her old self. But his truest mark of heroism comes right after. When the Chaos Kin tries to kill Dark Pit after his defeat, Dark Pit being Pit's literal opposite in every way, mind you, Pit doesn't even hesitate. He throws himself over the cliffside, using the power of flight to save his doppelganger knowing that he's burning out his own wings. It's an oddly valiant take on the myth of Icarus that Comic Foil explains really well in his character study of Pit that you should totally check out. Link in the description, subscribe to him while you're at it. But for me, it reminds me of a quote All Might tells Midoriya in My Hero Academia. To paraphrase, <clears throat> There is one similarity in the stories of all great heroes, young Midoriya. When they saw someone in danger, their bodies moved without thinking. Pit is clearly not a thinker. He sees injustice and he fights it. And like the best heroes, he's like a magnet pulling others to his cause. He's so stupidly pure of heart, he can't help but win over Magnus, Viridi, his own dark doppelganger, even Dinto's hard-to-please god of the forge, is so moved by Pit's courage enough to gift him a weapon strong enough to fight Hades. You know, it's probably a good thing that Pit's kinda dumb. A smarter person might not have attempted this, but, you know, you can't save the world if you don't try. Victory! Pit is a shining example of a dumb, bleeding heart hero. But I can think of one that shines a little brighter, and a little dumber. Our sweet summer child, Sora. Now I'm not the biggest Kingdom Hearts fan, the story is just a little too... ...nebulous for me. But I've never been shy about sharing the aspects of the series that I enjoy. Sora is often maligned by critics as an insufferably idiotic and overly upbeat protagonist. But I gotta put my foot down here. Sora is childish, Sora is weird, Sora says a lot of things that don't make sense, but he is the perfect hero for a game like Kingdom Hearts. Sharing many traits with Pit, he's young, optimistic, impulsive, and loyal to a fault. If there's one category Sora leaps ahead in, it's empathy. And in Kingdom Hearts, empathy is a potent source of power. Sora wasn't meant to be the hero in the first place. His sacred weapon, the Keyblade, was originally bequeathed to his best friend Riku, who better resembles the type of protagonist Square was writing at the time. Riku is tough, cunning, broody, and leagues better at almost everything than Sora, who by comparison acts more like the comedic sidekick. But Riku's ambition made him highly susceptible to... <laughs> and Sora soon found himself thrust into the role of backup hero. He went on to save multiple worlds multiple times through multiple games. Seriously, way too many games. But there is no problem Sora won't try to help with. This dude will stop to help anyone, and I mean anyone. Humans, animals, computer programs, even empty husks. That empathetic heart of his relates to everyone he meets, from princesses to pirates. Two-thirds of the games could be described as Sora just helping with problems that are none of his damn business. Sora's heart is so open to everyone, it becomes literal. Twice, Sora was so intrinsically caring that he harbored other people's fragmented hearts into his own. Once with Kairi in the first game, and again with Ventus when he was just a little kid. Actually, another time with Ventus, from worlds away when Sora was just being born. Then there's Roxas and Shion, rogue entities of Sora's soul that by all accounts shouldn't exist. But Sora has such compassion for them that he continues to see them as individuals and carries them with him. When a moment arises when Sora has to choose between his own life and that of his friends, no hesitation. Sora willingly turns himself into a Heartless to bring Kairi back. And yeah, this was easy enough for Kairi to reverse through the power of Huggy Wuggies, but Sora wasn't aware of that. This continues on until one day you realize Sora is at the very center of this sprawling narrative, connected to every prominent character through the emotional ties he's made. He doesn't just wield the key, he is the key. Dream Drop Distance actually plays with this in an interesting way, suggesting that Sora's willingness to carry the burden of everyone's problems makes him susceptible to Darkness. as well which is why he almost became the last organization member. Long story. I really would have liked to see that idea expanded upon, but Kingdom Hearts 3 went in other directions. I guess I tend to blame this on the writing as a whole more than Sora as a character, though the writing does go a long way to make Sora look like the biggest idiot to ever save all of reality. But you know what? That's okay. It's not Kingdom Brains, it's Kingdom Hearts, where being a good person also happens to make you all powerful.
given the last two entries, I may have given the impression that a low IQ is a positive for this list, which isn't the case. Heroes are allowed to be smarter than a bag of rocks. If it weren't for my one per franchise rule, I'd have considered Riku, mainly because he did one of the most difficult things for a hero to do. He picked himself back up after falling to... Darkness. Last time I'll use that bit, I promise. Luckily, Square has plenty of redeemed champions. My original list had Locke from Final Fantasy VI, but this time around, I gravitated towards Cecil Harvey from Final Fantasy IV. Having never known his parents, Cecil was raised by the royal family of Baron, treated like a son by their king. This being all he's ever known, he doesn't question it when the king trains him to become a Dark Knight, and loyally fulfills his duties as commander of the Red Wings, though he begins having doubts when the Red Wings are commanded to steal a sacred crystal from a relatively peaceful society of wizards. Though Cecil toes the line with his men at first, he takes the first opportunity to ask the king, Hey man, what the hell? His question is answered with unceremonious demotion, and he's sent to deliver a package to the village in the mist. If this wasn't suspicious enough, the package turns out to be a bomb that roasts the entire village of summoners, confirming Cecil's doubts, and from this point forward, he devotes himself to stopping the evil king of Baron, the evil knight Golbez who's controlling him, and eventually the lunar apparition Zeramis who's controlling that guy. It is admittedly easy for the player to forgive Cecil for his wrongdoing. I mean, he gives his father figure the benefit of the doubt at first, and doesn't knowingly do anything wrong. Additionally, his rehabilitation starts out pretty early in the game, but he still holds himself accountable for his role in Golbez's conquest, and spends the rest of the journey undoing his wrongs, first by protecting the little girl that survived the village exploding, then by undergoing a march of redemption in the Wizard Kingdom that he robbed. This trial pits him against a manifestation of his inner evil, which Cecil defeats not by casting and blasting, but by sheathing his blade and accepting his sins. This changes Cecil's class from Dark Knight into Paladin, a warrior of light who trades in malignant magic missiles for healing arts. It's not subtle, nor is it really detailed. This game came out in 1994, after all. But I can't think of many games in this era to feature a redemption arc like this and actually reflect it in the game's mechanics. Not only can Paladin Cecil smite evil with a sword, he can heal his comrades and even block attacks for them. You know, like a hero would do. I will say though, there's a little bit of Chosen One Syndrome with Cecil as well. He's actually half Lunarian, Golbez is his secret brother, and the writers are very Star Wars about it all. But what's more important here is that he devotes himself to good, which doesn't go unpunished in Final Fantasy IV. The party is constantly having their asses handed to them in this story, crystals are being stolen under their noses, party members sacrificing themselves left and right, and Cecil and company have to endure a whole lot of failure before they can actually find success. But having already rebuilt himself from the inside, Cecil never stays down for long. For many would-be heroes, the biggest obstacle is believing that you can be good after the mistakes you've made. But, hey, there's no problem that Cecil can't fix with a good sword and a phoenix down. Except, maybe, Tella. Yeah, he's not getting back up. Contrary to how this countdown's been going so far, you don't need to battle monsters or heartless or dark gods to be a hero. Maybe that was true in ancient times. The greatest heroes of myth, such as Gilgamesh, Heracles, and Siegfried, were all defined by their amazing feats rather than the good that they did for others. However, I believe we have plenty of heroes in real life that improve the world on a daily basis. Firefighters, medical professionals, lawyers? Okay, maybe not all lawyers. But, if a lawyer devotes their career to protecting the innocent, they can certainly be a great hero. Phoenix Wright is just about the nicest guy you can expect to meet in the justice system. Particularly in the Ace Attorney world where, if there's a crime, SOMEBODY'S gotta go to jail for it. Any law student would make their lives ten times easier by becoming a prosecutor. But Mr. Wright has never in his life made a choice that's made things easier on himself mainly due to the inspiration he received when Miles Edgeworth stood up for him in elementary school, and when his future mentor, Mia Fey, saves him from conviction after his crazy ex-girlfriend tried to frame him for murder. Upon passing the bar exam and taking a job at the Fey Law Office, Mia instilled Phoenix with the golden rule of any defense attorney. Trust in your client, 
no matter what. With that lesson, Phoenix would not only solve Mia's eventual murder, but save countless good-natured defendants from certain imprisonment and, in some cases, execution. So while he's not wielding a sword or a shield, he's certainly saving lives with that badge of his. Though he's constantly treated as the underdog, Phoenix has a remarkably high success rate in his trials, and becomes famous for flipping hopeless cases on their head. Part of this can be attributed to his intelligence. Phoenix is perceptive not only in finding clues at the crime scene, but also in learning what makes a witness tick, and knowing exactly how to present evidence to chip away at a liar's story. However, Phoenix is clearly outmatched in terms of wits against some of his better educated opponents. No. Phoenix's greatest asset is actually his intense commitment to protecting his charges, unafraid to debase and humiliate himself in the process. Phoenix will be ridiculed, sometimes physically assaulted or scalded with coffee, and he has to deal with some seriously uncooperative clients sometimes. Yet somehow, he manages to tunnel his way to the truth every single time. By the second game, he's gained a reputation for throwing out wild theories until something sticks. The fact that these theories are correct most of the time should be enough to get the prosecutors to back off. But that's what separates Phoenix from most of his contemporaries. He actually cares about the truth, not about what version of the story will win him his case and make him the most money as a lawyer. He really doesn't make that much. Representing people who can barely pay him, and having to support his late mentor's little sister Maya, who eats enough hamburgers to satisfy a family of four when she's not busy being accused of murder. This put-upon protagonist was able to believe in Edgeworth and defend him in court, even when Edgeworth himself thought he was guilty, not only saving Edgeworth's life and career, but also his very soul. All against the dreaded Manfred von Karma. Manfred is one in a line of prosecutors who had a perfect win record, until they went up against Phoenix. Man, good thing all of Phoenix's clients are innocent. Right? No. In Justice For All, Phoenix faces a moral dilemma when he's set to defend Matt on guard, who totally killed a guy. The dude's evil enough to make a glass of cognac appear out of his butt while in a maximum security detention center. But to make matters worse, on guard has Maya held hostage, and will have her killed if Phoenix doesn't get him off the hook. It's a lose-lose situation. But thanks to the help of some friends and ex-enemies, Phoenix finds a way to save Maya and put on guard behind bars, sacrificing his perfect win record. Seriously juxtaposes him with Manfred, who was willing to kill to keep his spotless ratio. So don't go saying that Phoenix is just doing his job defending people. When his girlfriend was on trial, he ate potentially poisonous evidence to try and defend her. Very misguided, but also stupidly chivalrous of him. He's courageous enough to take cases in the country of Kurayan, where a defense attorney must share the plaintiff's punishment if they're found guilty, and they are always found guilty. Sure, he's made mistakes, getting disbarred once for using forged evidence, but not only was that an accident and a setup, he made it right by his defendant by adopting his daughter while the man was in jail. And my absolute favorite, that time he ran across a burning bridge to save Maya. Physics won that fight, unfortunately, but I appreciate the effort. Remember, your body moves without thinking, young Midoriya. Sometimes being a hero isn't about what you have to give. It's about whether or not you're willing to give it all. And Phoenix, he gives it all. Seriously though, the dude needs a vacation. Court adjourned. Often when I do these kinds of lists, there's an entry that is so different from the others that they're hard to rank, so I usually just stick them somewhere in the middle. That happened to me twice with this countdown. First with Phoenix, who will never save the world, but will starve himself to save one plaintiff. The other is a criminal who, despite his nefarious career path, does nothing but help people and defend the innocent. Sorry Sly Cooper fans, I'm not talking about some plucky Robin Hood type. I'm talking about organized crime. I'm talking about the Yakuza. Kazuma Kiryu lost his parents at a young age due to the actions of a captain of the Dojima family, Shintaro Kazuma. 
Wracked with guilt, Shintaro adopted Kiryu, never telling him how his parents died. From Kiryu's perspective, this made Shintaro the coolest man in the world, and he wanted to be just like his adoptive daddy. So against Shintaro's own wishes, Kiryu entered the good life, starting as a low-level grunt roughing up poor people for loan sharks. Not off to a good start there, buddy, but it is easy to see Kiryu's outlook. He idolized the man who saved his life, and he's bought into a public misconception of organized crime. That it keeps the lesser criminals at bay and provides a necessary service for society. That's how Kiryu lives his noble life in this extremely ignoble career. Wandering the streets of Kamurocho like a samurai hero, breaking up fights and helping people with... <laughs> Well, just the dumbest side quests. There's no task too small for Kiryu, be it spearfishing, delivering pizza, or helping a dominatrix get her groove back. I give bonus points to any video game hero who can help townsfolk like a friendly neighborhood Spider-Man, but it's a particular joy to see Kiryu, stone-faced and serious, commit himself fully to every stupid problem he encounters. And God help you if you're harassing a lady or hurting a dog and he happens to walk by. Your ass is grass, and he's the goddamn lawnmower. Not that he'd ever kill you. Also like Spider-Man, Kiryu has a strict no-kill policy. But it's hard to imagine some of these thugs surviving the sadistic heat actions Kiryu can pull off. It's something of a game in the Yakuza fandom to justify how these goons survived in increasingly miraculous ways. Yeah, he's fine. Even opponents like Kuze, who will stop at nothing to see Kiryu dead, Kiryu will spare his life after a showdown because he refuses to be an executioner, and he accepts the threat to his own life by keeping Kuze alive. These showdowns, by the way, absolutely spectacular. They're as much of a clash of ideals as a physical struggle. Two men casting off their shirts to reveal elaborate tattoos and bearing everything they are in single combat. If Kiryu's strength seems superhuman, it's only because he believes so faithfully in his code of honor. To never kill, to never raise his hand to a woman, and consequently to never be in Smash Brothers. You'll also recall that I ranked Kiryu number one on my Crime Lords countdown as he managed to become the fourth chairman of the Dojima clan at the end of the first game. Only to immediately resign. Kiryu actually spends most of his life not in the Yakuza. His illusion shatters pretty early on. So he retires to run his own orphanage, truly becoming the hero he saw in Shintaro. He didn't even have to kill any of those parents himself. But they keep pulling him back in and the rest of the series consists of Kiryu trying to right the wrongs of the crime world, help some old workmates here and there, and hopefully get back to his new quiet life. Easier said than done, but time and again, Kiryu returns to the underbelly of Japan. There's plenty of villains and antiheroes who use the greater good to justify evil, but even when submerged in a life of crime, Kiryu would never knowingly compromise his integrity. He is a lawful good man in a chaotic evil world, and he's never killed anyone. I swear, you can't prove anything. <laughs> eh, sprained wrist at most. So those were two heroes that could conceivably exist in our world, trying to make it a better place but let's go back to outright saving the world. Hell, why not make it the whole galaxy? I'm talking, of course, about Samus Aran. She's the first character to make a comeback from my original heroes list, and I'd say Samus is even more worthy of that spot now than she was 10 years ago. After her parents were eaten by an alien pirate dragon and her home space station was destroyed, Samus was raised by the enigmatic sages of the Chozo race, who soon after went nearly extinct. So, Samus became a soldier of the Galactic Federation under Adam Malkovich, who had a major falling out with Samus after his brother died, so she became a bounty hunter. You know those clickbaity, name a character who suffered more posts? I've always hated those, but Samus is up there. Fortunately, bounty hunting turned out to be her true calling. Unlike similar bounty hunter characters, Samus still works almost exclusively for the Galactic Government, staying within the bounds of their laws. 
Whatever they pay her, though, it's not enough considering she solos so many high-priority missions that the armed forces fail to handle. I know I've been focusing more on the morals of our heroes rather than their feats, but dude, how about these feats? Five counts of crippling the Space Pirates, the largest crime group in the known universe, two wins against Mother Brain and another against a humanoid clone of her, the extermination of the parasitic Metroid species, the extermination of the X-Parasites that the Metroids were made to fight in the first place, the eradication of the Caustic Phazon, and three victories against Metroid Prime. Not to mention slaying that dragon that killed her parents no less than eight times. Samus is a walking artillery cannon, a mobile doomsday device, and even when she's stripped of her weapons, which is pretty common more so than Samus would ever care to admit, she's resourceful enough to traverse enemy territory while slowly rebuilding her arsenal. And okay, she's collecting payment for her work, same as Phoenix, it's her job. But one, she could have chosen a less dangerous job, seriously, she'd make a killing as an acrobat. And two, like Phoenix and Kiryu, she has the moral fiber to not do her job when it's not the right thing to do. Case in point, Metroid Fusion. It turns out that the Federation Research Facility was trying to recreate Metroids. You know, those energy-sapping bioenergy blights upon the galaxy? Also, Ridley again, for some reason. Samus was sent to protect the facility from the X-Parasites, but Samus says, Fuck it, I'm going to blow this whole thing up. Stop cloning Metroids! Samus probably didn't get paid that day, but she definitely saved the galaxy. And that brings me to Metroid Dread, which cements Samus on this list for me. Spoiler alert for those of you who haven't played it yet, but the way I see it, Dread's story is the completion of Samus' destiny. Having her uncover the darker side of her beloved Chozo people, and take down the bird behind their demise once and for all, taking responsibility for her adopted culture. <laughs> No Metroids in this game, oddly enough, except Samus herself, which brings the arc full circle. In Zero Mission, she discovers what Metroids were. In Samus Returns, she kills them all, save for a baby that she rescued for research. The baby would give its life to save her in Super Metroid, and its DNA would become part of Samus in Fusion. In Dread, Ravenbeak refers to Samus as THE Metroid, because she's the last source of its genetic code in the galaxy, which he needs for his plan. But it takes on another meaning when that latent DNA awakens, and Samus gains the Metroid's energy-absorbing powers. In the manga, we learn that the Chozo named these creatures Metroids after a word in their native language, meaning Ultimate Warrior. And now, at the end of it all, Samus becomes the last Metroid, the pride of the Chozo, the specter of the Federation, the bane of evil everywhere. The ultimate warrior. She's taken everything she's learned from the formative stages of her life, empowering herself with their successes and correcting their failures. She has lost comrades to corrupting Phazon, tearfully executed them, and resisted that same corruption herself. She's been confronted with shadowy versions of her worst self and overcame them with a weaker arsenal, in two different forms, and has grown into the most complete version of Samus Aran. A courageous hero who might just be the most powerful being in the universe, who also happens to have a soft spot for animals. The galaxy has a new Metroid Queen, and she's a lot easier on the eyes than the last one. Speaking of career paths that are inherently heroic, what could be more brave than becoming a soldier, putting your life on the line in service to your countrymen? Not that I think every member of the armed forces is automatically a hero, see Spec Ops The Line, and even the games that honor them show that the elite protectors have to do some morally gruesome things. No, I'm not bad. But like it or not, I sometimes have to do bad things. However, gaming still has enough brave soldiers to form a platoon of heroism. John Price, Jim Raynor, Sam Fisher, Zach Fair, hell, the Master Chief. But my favorite story of the hardships of war belongs to a man named David, better known as Solid Snake. To be fair, Snake didn't choose the life of a soldier, it was laid out for him. Cloned from the greatest agent of all time, Big Boss, in an attempt to recreate a skill set, little David was dragged from foster home to foster home until he was old enough to join the Green Berets and eventually the covert ops group Foxhound. While in Foxhound, Snake performed two perilous solo missions, infiltrating Outer Heaven and infiltrating Zanzibar Land. 
Both times, he uncovered heartbreaking betrayals and destroyed the nuclear-armed Metal Gears, no doubt preventing large-scale catastrophes. After wrestling with PTSD from these experiences, Snake was pulled out of retirement to destroy a third Metal Gear on Shadow Moses Island, where he did battle with his cloned brother Liquid Snake and learned just how much of a pawn he was. Before beginning his mission, Snake had been secretly injected with the Fox Dye virus in an attempt to kill the Genome soldiers in Foxhound's ranks. To make matters worse, the doctor who injected him, Naomi Hunter, had a vendetta against Snake for killing her adopted brother and designed the virus so that it could activate and kill Snake at any moment, be it 5 minutes or 40 years. Snake completes his mission and escapes with his life, much to the chagrin of the US government, and devotes the rest of his days to working freelance forming a group called Philanthropy and traveling the world to disassemble every Metal Gear he can get intel on, knowing at any time he might drop dead from the virus. Damn, when Samus got injected, she got cool Metroid powers, Snake got Russian Roulette disease. Ugh. Like Samus, Snake gets points not only for being a badass soldier, but for drawing the line in the sand when his orders are wrong. The Pentagon didn't send him to Shadow Moses to save lives from a nuclear strike, they did it to cover up their shady dealings, and Snake says, nah, I'm not gonna do that. And like I've mentioned with characters like Pitt and Phoenix, he's made it this far largely by earning the respect of former enemies, who come to his aid at critical junctures. Most notable to me is Gray Fox, who went from ally to enemy to helping Snake kill Rex and Naomi Hunter. When she explains her reasoning for messing with the Fox Die virus, effectively killing Snake in the most inhumane way I can imagine, Snake responds with kindness and understanding. This unprecedented moment of humanity sets Naomi on a path to help save the world in Metal Gear Solid 4. Also, Snake adopted one of his fallen comrade's daughters who he now raises with his lifelong partner Otacon. By the way, that's three people raising orphans on this list. But Snake's heroism isn't defined by the people he saves, his skills with every weapon, or his resemblance to an 80s action star. It's in his sacrifice. Snake has given everything for his country, Nate, the world, to prevent wars and grant true freedom from the Patriots. Those genetic enhancements he received to become such a world-class agent have also afflicted him with rapid aging. By Metal Gear Solid 4, Snake is 42 years old, but he looks ready to play Santa Claus. To shut down the Patriots' computer once and for all, he has to crawl through a goddamn microwave, bearing excruciating pain and irreparable bodily damage. And at many times, the media is turned against him, forcing him to fake his own death and ensuring he goes unrecognized for his good deeds. And when his mission is done, it turns out that the Fox Die virus is set to mutate and start killing everyone around him indiscriminately. So to prevent himself from becoming a biological weapon, Snake very nearly takes his own life. Fortunately, he's stopped and cured at the last second by his father and on-again, off-again enemy Big Boss in what is to me one of the most cathartic scenes in video game history. Snake reconciling with his past, again without anger but kindness and understanding, even lighting his old man's last cigar before he passes away. There's a line that always gets me from Otacon, where he simply says, Snake had a hard life. Understatement of the goddamn century, but it is so apt. Because what else is there to say? Snake gave a lot to the world. But more importantly, he gave everything. Some old, some new when it comes to remaking this list. But even after 10 trips around the sun, the old mantra remains true. We. Like. Ike. There had to be a Fire Emblem character here somewhere, and I'm not gonna pretend it was any contest who. Lin may be my ultimate waifu, but when it comes to a hero's journey, Ike carries that burden the same way he carries every team he's on. I've remarked this many times in other videos, particularly my ongoing Let's Play of Atelier Saga, but there's something special about Ike as the game's Lord unit. Fire Emblem Lords, with very few exceptions, are royalty of some kind. Marth is the Prince of Altea, Leaf is the Prince of Leonster, Alm turns out to be the heir of Regal, and so on and so forth. Many games start with an invasion of the hero's homeland, and the hero needs to grow up fast to take on the duties of their late parents. 
And if they aren't royalty, it's because they have some kind of other divine connection that makes them the center of this conflict, like Byleth or Robin. Ike is... just a guy. Okay, to be fair, he is the son of Grail, leader of the Grail mercenaries, who turns out to be a super famous knight in hiding, and being Grail's son gave Ike access to some expert training when he was young. When Grail dies in a very Obi-Wan fashion to a man in black armor, Ike inherits his mercenary party despite not being the most qualified to do so. My point is that Ike didn't have to be the hero of this grand story. There's no inherent chosen one specialness to him, he's just a hard worker with a strong sense of justice. We really get to see Ike grow over the course of these two games, starting with his training chapters fighting pirates and hiding behind Gatry. The story starts when Grail undertakes a bit of a suicide mission for the mercenary groups, transporting a displaced princess to safe haven despite it being dangerous and unprofitable. Ike's first act as Grail's successor is to uphold this mission, because it's the right thing to do. Ike goes on to escort Princess Alencia not only across the border to Gallia, but across the entire continent to Benyan to seek allies, and continues his Tellius tour by leading an entire army to defeat the devious despot of Dayan and reclaim the captured country of Crimea. Leading the mercenaries may be a case of nepotism on Grail's part, but Ike is chosen to lead the attack on Dayan not because of some bloodline, or because the gods parted the heavens and shone thine holy light upon him, but because he proves himself the best for the job. Ike is an amazing leader. He's not a great conversationalist, mind you, but he's very adept at delegating his subordinates to where they each shine the most. Even when he lacks battlefield experience, Ike understands to lean on a strong council, relying on Titania's wisdom and Soren's tactical acumen. These games put a much greater emphasis on the minutia of the militia, keeping an army fed and motivated, building a rapport with weapons dealers, and relying on advisors. While Ike may not always agree with others, he values different viewpoints and uses them to keep an open mind, so he rarely gets blindsided in combat. This allows him to bridge relations between his men and the Lagoos, quickly overcoming some racial misconceptions and learning to work with their unique talents. That actually might be part of what makes Ike such an impressive swordsman. As a unit, he has a lot in common with the mercenary class from the GBA games, but with some swordmaster speed, possibly from sparring with Mia, and influence from the Tiger Lagoos because Ike is an absolute beast. Especially after the time skip when Ike goes from do you even lift to what can't you lift? Shortly after the Mad King's War, Ike was offered a position in Crimea's court, but immediately renounced that honor when it became clear his presence was hurting Alencia's credibility. And when his Lagoos buddy Ronolf asks Ike to fight the biggest empire in Tellius, Ike doesn't hesitate. Granted, he never liked those stuffed shirts anyway. Ike sees past racial bias, class bias, and religious bias. Hell, he kills a goddess when he gets sick of her bullshit, and then pieces out from Tellius forever like an absolute boss. I don't know what crazy adventures he got into after that, but if Priam is anything to go by, Ike's legacy has some serious shelf life. Ike's the kind of hero they write folk songs about, swung a two-handed sword like it was weightless, slew a room of 30 dragons, ran with lions, and avenged his father from a black knight. And to see him go from a shrimpy kid to this blue-haired behemoth is an inspiration. And the dude doesn't even need a horse! Before I award the silver medal, I want to talk about an honorable mention. During ranking, I spent a lot of consideration on Cole McGrath, the electrokinetic vigilante from Infamous 1 and 2. When you play him as a good guy, obviously. A superpowered individual, or conduit as this world calls them, Cole can be played as an altruistic savior who rescues civilians, spurred on by his own evil future doppelganger to become the best version of himself. No matter how altruistic you are, however, the second game will end with a critical ultimatum, where Cole has to either activate the Ray Sphere to kill all conduits on the planet, including himself, or go full Magneto and kill all non-conduits. It's a trolley problem, and while one option certainly results in fewer deaths, it also means betraying your own people. At the end of the day, neither choice is what I'd call heroic. Now, that's no slight against Infamous. I think the strongest theme in this game is that despite all the friendly neighborhood metahumans, there are no true heroes in the world of Infamous, because everything you do is the detriment of someone. 
You could agree it takes a real hero to make this kind of impossible choice, but to me, I've always preferred the hero who fights for the third option who refuses to accept the binary trolley problem and flips the trolley off the rails, saving everyone. And that's the quality I see in Commander Shepard. Commander Shepard walks the line between being a blank slate for the player and having an actual character. Or maybe like three possible characters. The Mass Effect trilogy is predicated on player choice, so if you choose, you can play as Dick Dazzardly Shepard, letting your teammates die and punching reporters in the face. I've had enough of your snide insinuations. But go all Paragon and Shepard becomes an interplanetary Captain America. Or Captain Humanity, I should say, as they are the first human being to ever earn the title of Spectre, serving the Council as a special recon operative to preserve galactic peace. Shepard doesn't always get along with the Council, who insults Shepard over every decision they make, but the true Paragon Shepard works within the bounds of both the law and of basic decency, which takes many forms among the many alien cultures you interact with. Renegade Shepard can be quite the racist, but Paragon Shepard sees people for who they are, and values the different talents that each recruit brings to the table, from Krogan warrior Rex to Solarian scientist Morden. Even races that most people don't consider worth saving, like the Geth, Shepard sees their right to live and fights to protect that right, often at great personal risk to themselves. It's no exaggeration to say that they give their life for the cause, because in Mass Effect 2, they actually do. They're resurrected immediately afterwards by a shadowy organization who sees them as potentially useful, but the fact that Shepard can earn so much renown to be worth that greater resurrection speaks volumes. And if you like those morally great ultimatums, there's still plenty of those. Like how they deal with a genophage that threatens the entire Krogan race with extinction, prior to which they were multiplying out of control and unsustainably devouring resources while picking a fight with anything that moves. Or how they handle the robotic Geth and their war against the Quarians. Do they let one side wipe out the other, or let a friend sacrifice themselves to rewrite the Geth's genocidal programming? The galaxy repeatedly relies on Shepard's wisdom to make these calls. But the impossible situation I think of is the suicide mission in Mass Effect 2. Everything you've done up to this point comes to a head. The friendships you've forged, the loyalty missions you've embarked on, the resources you've mined, and the split-second calls you're forced to make to pull off this Ocean's Eleven-esque scheme against the Collectors. The number of possible outcomes is staggering. Anyone can live or die, even Shepard himself. You'll have to choose who takes the fall for the galaxy. Or, you can put your nose to the grindstone and get everyone out in one piece. It's not easy, heck, without a guide it's nearly impossible. But Shepard shines their brightest in the darkest hour. You can play Shepard so goddamn perfect it's absurd. They're basically a messiah. Everyone sings their praises as you roam around the citadel, ending moral debates with a single word. Every ally they meet is better for it, their closest confidants transforming from ragtag misfits to Krogan kings, unparalleled bounty hunters, and in one case, the freaking Shadow Broker. Paragon Shepard, as much as I hate to use this term, borders on Mary's Sunis for how impressive they are and how everyone's lives revolve around them. Except since you're the one who drove their actions, you know what? I earned this praise! I'm the one who punched out the Robo-Cthulhus, and I'm the one who is the hero of the galaxy. Give me a gun and point me at the Reapers. I'll take care of them lickety-split and celebrate at my favorite store in the Citadel. Um, Commander Shepard, how are you going to take care of the Reapers, exactly? Uh, what do you mean? I'm gonna fight them off. No, I mean the ethical part, the Crucible. What are you going to do with it? Oh. Oh, fuck. Okay, so Mass Effect 3's ending is... controversial, to say the least. I'm not here to defend its vague ramifications or its choose-your-favorite ice cream flavor final prompt. I'm just here to point out that three out of these four major ending categories involve Shepard sacrificing themselves for whatever you, the player, thinks is best for everyone in existence. It doesn't matter what the conclusion is, Shepard thinks it's right, and lays down on that grenade. And that's just mustard on the hero sandwich. The Collector's suicide mission is more than enough of a feat to get Shepard up here in my book. 
Sure, Shepard can't solve every problem in the universe in a way that everyone wins, but damn, I want to meet the hero who can. If we're going to be remaking these lists, I think it's important to use the original as a point of reference and reflection. I was pretty predictable back in the day, and The Legend of Zelda was always my favorite series, so of course I picked Link as my number one hero back then. Real original. And a little unfair now that I'm looking at it. First of all, that's choosing one character and attributing him to the actions of like 12 different heroes. It's not the same guy in all these games, you know. Furthermore, Link falls into the generic blank slate role for the player. Most of what's special about him as a character was merely projected onto him by fans. Choosing him was about the most basic bitch way I could have kicked off my countdown career. And you know what? I don't care. Any of the top 5 heroes on this list could be number 1, and going in, I tried to reevaluate my opinion. But it would be disingenuous to pretend that Link isn't my top hero. He's the perfect formula for heroes in video games in general. Before 1986, video game characters were more often than not spaceships or tanks. What few heroes there were, like Mario and Pac-Man, had pretty simple resumes, traveling linear environments or repeating the same task ad infinitum. But then there was Hyrule, a wide open environment to explore. Not only was it on you and your green-clad surrogate to save the princess and defeat the king of monsters, it was your job to figure out how. Aside from a few outliers like Adventure on the Atari, this was gaming's first quest, and Link was your window into this world. That's why his name is Link, after all. I mean, until Breath of the Wild, his name wasn't even required to be Link. That's more of a placeholder name. But that's also true of Cecil, so I'm not gonna make a big deal out of it. In the 80s, characters weren't required to have motivations that drove them to become a hero. Link was the best guy for the job because you were. Because you wanted to travel Hyrule and defeat Ganon. Because it would be fun for you. Of course, it didn't stay that way. With stories taking more precedent in games, heroes now needed motivation, and Link, more than most classic icons, adapted to that standard. We get many types of motivation, actually, since most of Link's games start with him in a new time period without the memories of previous outings. Sometimes, it's a call of destiny. In Link to the Past, he's receiving psychic distress signals from Zelda, and in Ocarina of Time, he's having prophetic dreams. But the best Zelda stories, in my opinion, are those where Link sets out on a smaller journey personal to him, and along the way gets wrapped up in the fate of the world. In Wind Waker, he's saving his sister. In Twilight Princess, it's rescuing all the kids in Ordon Village. And in Skyward Sword, it's liberating his kinda sorta girlfriend. In this way, you have to keep something very important in mind. Link could very easily refuse the Call of Destiny. He's an easygoing guy who sleeps a lot and enjoys his humble life in whatever rural environment he's been reincarnated into. Look at Toon Link when he has to wear the tunic, he hates it! But something's wrong. The Great Deku Tree is sick. The moon is falling. Link can't pretend it doesn't affect his remote lifestyle, so he's gonna suit up and check it out, because despite what the other Kokiri or the older Skyloft students say, he might be the best Hylian for the job. Link quickly grows into a master swordsman over the course of each outing. Link's fighting style is truly unique, and while the weapon enthusiast in me wants to cry foul on the unnecessary spins and jumping down thrusts, in the Zelda universe, it seems to work. Maybe it's the sheer fearlessness of these unorthodox attacks that throws his enemies off, along with him screaming incoherently with each swing. Why is he yelling? I don't know. I don't know. Link is also, by virtue of the player, an avid problem solver. A Zelda game is as much of a puzzle game as it is an adventure, and Link is likely to find simple solutions for complex problems. This employs an array of tools and weapons, which Link can grow proficient with in short periods of practice. Many say that this is tied to him being the Keeper of the Triforce of Courage, and I tend to agree with that theory. On the one hand, this could be seen as Chosen One Syndrome saying that there will always be a Link, and thereby granting each of them the role of the hero before they even earn it. That's the same sort of thing that I praised Ike for not doing a few entries ago, so what gives? Well, I consider all of these Link occurrences as part of the same whole, a hero of a thousand familiar faces, taking a slightly different view every time they're reincarnated. 
As such, I think the Triforce of Courage comes to Link because he earns it, each and every time. Whether it's dodging boulders to get a sword and help his patron deity, fighting giant mechs in order to get them under control, or this stupid-ass Triforce piece fetch quest, Link manages to overcome each and every task set before him. Along with tasks that he really doesn't need to go out of his way to do. Link is a man who will help anyone with anything, with problems as big as Calamity Ganon or as small as a flock of escaped chickens. A man who took the time out of his busy apocalypse to reunite a couple in love. A man who, might I remind you, was the first person to hold all three pieces of the Triforce at once. Which is fitting because, honestly, he embodies all three of these virtues. He's got the smarts to deal with this sliding block dungeon, escape the lost woods or operate a train. And you want power? Link defeats multi-story monstrosities on the regular. We most associate him with courage because he always steps up to meet death-defying situations head on. A favorite of mine is the beginning of Wind Waker. Seeing his sister being carried off by a giant bird, Link wants to save her so much he runs headfirst off a cliff trying to will himself to her. Now that's a young Midoriya moment right there. All of the heroes on this list have had that point in their origin, where they first become a true hero. Maybe it's when Sora left Destiny Island, when Phoenix agreed to represent Edgeworth, or when Samus faced down Ridley for the first time. But Link has had a dozen lives and proves himself a true hero again and again and again. He is the spirit of heroism itself and I can think of no other one who deserves this honor more. Sorry everyone, I think I got it right the first time. I'm the Green Scorpion, and thank you for joining me in celebrating the true paragons of gaming. Next time... Join the darkness. We have sugared confections.